Y'all, I've got a confession. I love microphones. It makes me really happy when I get the mic on the sound source in just the right place and it inspires a great performance and I get to capture it. It makes all the rest of the jobs in audio a lot easier. So how do microphones work? Well, today we're gonna dive in and find out. The most common type of microphone that you'll find on a live sound stage is a moving coil microphone. It uses magnetic induction to make it work, but we'll explain how all that works in just a minute. These mics are rugged and reliable, and they're good at rejecting feedback. And on the whole, they can be a lot less expensive than other types of microphones, which is good, especially if we're carting them around, throwing them in the back of a truck, or could be dropped and stepped on from getting used so often. Oh, hey, if you're new here, my name's James, and I usually talk about live sound, but today we're gonna talk a little bit about studio as well. So if you like making stuff sound great, go ahead and mash that subscribe button. The next type of microphone you'll see is the condenser microphone. If we're gonna get nerdy, it's really called a capacitor microphone, but nobody actually says that word in the real world, only nerds. They can be a little bit more expensive, they have a higher output, and they can be more fragile as well. Now these are generalizations. There are some that are super rugged also, but on the whole, it's a lot easier to damage a condenser microphone than it is a moving coil microphone. Because of their increased sensitivity, it's more likely that they'll feed back. So that's why we often see them less on live sound stages where it can be noisy and the sound of the PA can get picked up by the microphone as well. We'll talk about these and another mic type a little bit later, but for now, let's focus on the moving coil microphone. And they're often called dynamic microphones, but that's actually a bigger category, but you don't really need to know that unless you're a nerd. So the moving coil microphone uses magnetic induction to change the vibration in air molecules into an electrical signal. Devices that take one form of energy and transmit it to another form of energy is called a transducer. So if you hear somebody say that, that's what they mean. The signal on the output of the microphone is wiggling electrons that can be transmitted down a mic cable to your mixer and then amplified in various stages and then to a speaker again. When we have this transducer and it's taking the wiggling air molecules and changing them to the wiggling electrons, that signal of wiggling electrons is analogous to the wiggling air molecules. That's why we call this analog audio signals. So we have three main parts of the moving coil microphone. There's the diaphragm or the piece of plastic or thin metal that actually catches the vibrations of the air molecules. That's attached to a wire coil that's wrapped around a permanent magnet. That magnet wants to hold on to all the electrons in that magnetic field. So as the coil moves back and forth, with the diaphragm moving back and forth, those electrons wanna stay in the same place based on that magnetic field. But this ends up making a domino effect with all the other electrons down the mic cable, and that sends our electrical signal at a very small voltage someplace else. For pro audio microphones, you'll find an XLR connector on the end, and it's got three pins. If you've got a microphone that just has a quarter inch cable on its output, and it's usually made of molded plastic, you just wanna pass that along to your least favorite karaoke bar because it's not for professionals. The signal level on the output of this moving coil microphone is very low, so at the other end, we need a microphone preamp to boost it up to a level that's usable for all the rest of our gear. A condenser microphone operates on a very different principle than magnetic induction. The condenser microphone puts a diaphragm in front of a fixed charged plate, and the little gap between the diaphragm and that charged plate creates some capacitance. As the distance of that gap changes, the capacitance varies. So it's called a variable capacitance microphone, and that's what creates a very small kind of noisy voltage inside the microphone. Because this small voltage can't go very far without being really noisy, we put an amplifier inside the microphone so that we can boost it up at least to mic level. It's not the same as the microphone preamp on your console, but we have to get some power to this preamp inside the condenser microphone. Now, if you want a more in-depth discussion about how the variable capacitance turns into a voltage, you won't find it here because I'm at the very edge of my electrical engineering knowledge. What I can tell you is that the little preamp inside of the condenser microphone needs some power. And how are we gonna get it there? Enter Phantom Power. Now some really smart dudes figured out that you can send DC power down the same mic cable that you're using to get your audio signal to your console. There's not a separate cable or connector for it, and so they call it phantom power. Phantom because there's no separate or special cable. 
If we can dive into history a little bit, tube microphones were the way that we powered a condenser mic back before solid state electronics became popular. Microphones actually had a tube circuit inside of it, and it required a high voltage to run that tube preamp. So to get the power that that tube preamp needed, you had to have a special cable and a separate power supply that then supplied the audio output to your console. Back to the modern era, what that means for you is that if you plug in a microphone and you turn it up and you turn up the preamp and it's just noisy and a very weak signal, chances are it's a condenser microphone and you need to supply phantom power. You can find this with the plus 48 button on your console. Be sure to gain it back down before you turn this on or you'll create feedback in a sound tech solo. And we don't want that. So take my advice, mute it and turn it down before turning on the phantom power. Condenser mics can come in a variety of form factors and a variety of capsule or diaphragm sizes. A lot of times you'll find small diaphragm condensers in a pencil type design. And these are end address, or the microphone's pickup pattern is focused on the end of that microphone. A lot of times a large diaphragm condenser microphone will be side address, and you'll see this cage around it that acts as a windscreen. If you're unsure of which side is the front, go with the logo badge from the company that made it. Another feature about large diaphragm condenser mics is you can have variable polar patterns. Polar patterns are the way and the direction that the mic picks up and rejects sound. Some mics have multiple diaphragms inside them, so we can choose cardioid, figure eight, or even omnidirectional. If you're confused by that, we'll talk more about it in just a second. The other thing about condenser mics is they can be damaged, either by getting dropped or having too much plosives or SPL coming into the microphone. This is especially true for older microphones, or they can just get damaged. Because of their increased sensitivity, condenser mics can also get overloaded by having too much SPL, and then their internal preamp starts to clip and distort. You can solve this problem with a pad that's usually built on with a switch at the microphone itself. That also gives you a little bit more control of the level at your mic preamp. So for loud inputs like drums, go ahead and switch the pad on your condenser microphones. Now, ribbon microphones are seldom used in live sound, but they can make their way to the stage and work brilliantly. So let's check them out. You've probably seen a model of one of these old ones in front of Frank Sinatra or David Letterman. They can sound really warm and have this nice full feeling that you might not get from a condenser microphone. The way it works is very similar to the way a moving coil microphone works. In fact, it also uses magnetic induction. But instead of a diaphragm attached to a coil, this uses a U-shaped magnet with a corrugated ribbon suspended in between there. As the ribbon wiggles back and forth, it creates a small voltage as well and sends that to the mic cable. Ribbon mics typically have a little less output than dynamic or condenser microphones as well. So having a really low noise mic preamp or even something like a cloud lifter in between the mic and the console can help get you a lot more output from your microphone. Royer even makes an active ribbon microphone that has a little preamp inside it, a lot like a condenser. Royer even makes a tube ribbon microphone, and those are really cool. If you wanna donate one to me, I would gladly receive that. The really cool thing about ribbon microphones is they have a really smooth top end that takes EQ really well. They seem a little darker at first, but they get really smooth as you boost with a high shelf. Older ribbon microphones cannot tolerate phantom power. So if you've got something vintage or it's designed like something vintage, do not send phantom power to that microphone. Some of the more modern ribbon microphones can tolerate phantom power, but not if you're using a patch cable and plugging it in while phantom power is on. So just be careful with ribbon mics and phantom power and you'll take good care of them. The modern mics can also take a high SPL, but you still wanna watch out for air velocity. So don't stick it right in front of the port on a kick drum or something like that. That can damage the ribbon element and then you have to send it in for repair and that gets expensive. The real challenge of using ribbon mics on a stage is that they're a figure eight pattern most of the time. That means it picks up in the front, but it picks up equally in the back. So. If you're doing that on a noisy stage and the back of it is pointed toward a loud sound source, you're gonna pick that up quite a bit as well. They work great on electric guitar amps and it's hard to get them to be too harsh. So that can be really helpful, especially if you blend it in with another microphone to get that both and part of the smooth top end and a little bit more bite. All right, we've danced around the issue of polar patterns, but we need to dive into this topic a little deeper now. The polar pattern is where the mic picks up sound and where it rejects sound from. 
And it's really not perfect across all frequencies. It changes based on the high or low frequencies that it's trying to pick up. There are a few ways to do it, and one of them is with multiple diaphragms arranged in different ways, like we saw on the side address condenser microphones. With end address microphones, like our vocal microphones, the sound comes in through the ports over here and then bends around the top as well. As they arrive at the diaphragm, certain frequencies will cancel out, giving you rejection from the backside of that microphone. This microphone is a super cardioid microphone, which looks very similar to the polar pattern of this one, but it's a little bit narrower and rejects a little bit more from the sides, but the trade-off is that you get a little lobe coming off the back where it will pick up sound. This is important if you have monitor wedges, because if you point the back of this microphone at the monitor wedge, it's gonna feed back really fast. Whereas this one, you want to point the back of the microphone right at the monitor wedge. That's gonna reject the most sound and get you the best gain before feedback. When a mic picks up from all directions, we call that omnidirectional or non-directional. It's everything and nothing all at the same time. When people put their hand over the microphone like this and cover up the ports, they're actually not blocking out more sound, they're blocking the sound that was canceling out from the back side of the microphone. So essentially you've made your microphone omnidirectional and that's not a good thing, especially if it's starting to feed back. If you take a look at the SM57, this little crown shaped plastic thing on the back is actually what's creating the polar pattern for that microphone. So if your drummer has bashed that microphone and broken that piece, you now have an omnidirectional microphone that's picking up a ton of hi-hat and that's why. So that's a simple overview of microphones and how they work. If you want a deeper dive, I'm game. Just let me know down in the comments. I would love to go deeper on microphones, but I gotta know that you care about it first. If you love nerding out about audio and making your live shows and recordings sound their best, go ahead and mash that subscribe button. And remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo, and nobody leaves humming the kick drum. You can support this channel by buying me a coffee. There's a link down below. And remember to like and share this with a friend who might need to know how to use the mic the right way. We'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.